Right, welcome back to the Security Conversations podcast. My guest needs no introduction, really. Marty Resch is CEO of Netography, and we'll get into the co-founding and, and the new company in a bit. But Marty, you're more, more well-known for creating Snort back in the day, mm-hmm. uh, uh, creating Source Fire, selling that to Cisco, and like just being an eyeball to the birth and, and emergence of this entire security industry. Can you take me back to those days? Take me back to the creation of Snort, if you will. What was, uh, what was the idea behind it? And, and if you can talk a little bit about what the threat landscape looked like at the time. Well, that's, a, that's an interesting question. So let's see. Uh, back to the beginning. Um, so back in the late 90s, so Snort, first lines of code for Snort were laid down in November of 98. And... Um, Pre-Blaster, pre-Sasser, pre-Worm era, pre-all of that stuff. Yeah, exactly. So uh, buffer overflows were a big topic of conversation, and there were you know theories about how wormable things would be or not. Uh, and But we hadn't really seen any uh, truly big worms apart from kind of the, the first one, the Morris worm back in the, in the late 80s. And um, so all this stuff was kind of in the background. And I, I personally had just gotten started in security a couple of years before 98. So I, I started in the, the uh, industry as a government contractor in 96. Mm-hmm. And um, so one of the ways, you know, back then there were, you couldn't get a degree in, in information security or anything like that. If you did anything security related in college, it was probably going to be around uh, cryptography, right? Right. Um, or maybe information theory and, and stuff like that. <clears throat> so um, we all had to teach ourselves back then. Uh, so one of the ways that I liked to teach myself, because you know my engineering background is is kind of what uh, drives a lot of my thinking, is um, writing my own tools. So uh, I went and looked at other people's open source tools and kind of saw how they did stuff. But for me, like um, doing you were already a coder, you were already a coder working in government service. Yeah. Uh, uh, okay. Yeah, so my uh, I, I graduated in the early '90s um, with a computer engineering degree. So uh, you know, I actually um, coded professionally uh, before I did government stuff. I, I did you know contract engineering, and I uh, worked for a little uh, software company and stuff like that. When you think back to like the late '90s, right around that period, this is pre malware, right? Mm-hmm. Pre ransomware, pre all of this stuff. What are you defending against? What was the 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 Big attack surface or the big attack lands uh, attack vector at the time. Uh, well, we knew about uh, buffer overflows; they were a real thing back then, right? But this was just a lot of theoretical uh, academic research into memory safety issues. Mudge had his famous paper, like right around that mid to late nineties. There was a lot yeah. of academic issues around this. So this was when governments were starting to, big organizations were starting to pay attention to this coming down the pike, right? Yeah, exactly. And but you know, some of the earliest rules in Snort were for detecting no op sleds, for example. Uh, ah. So maybe not not necessarily picking up the buffer overflow itself, but for picking up the op sled uh, that was indicating a buffer overflow was in progress. So uh, the thing that really got me writing Snort in the first place, besides just teaching myself the security. Um, discipline by writing the tools was I just wanted to uh, keep tabs on what was going on in my home network while I was at work during the day. So, um, you know, I had a cable modem and uh, I had a, a computer set up. You know, I wasn't on a switch network. We had uh, hubs back then. And um, so I'd kick off uh, Snort in the morning and I'd go to work and then I'd come back at night. And I uh, this was back before Snort had a detection engine. It was just doing packet logging. So I logged, the, you know, um, dump the packets, and then I'd dig through the directory structure looking at you know, like who'd been knocking on the door uh, while I was at work. Because networks were much quieter back then, too. We didn't have all these uh, really chatty services and things like that. Um, it was kind of interesting. You know, you'd pick up uh, people you know, knocking on the door, port scanning and uh, uh, ping sweeping and stuff like that. That was like still that. a thing back then. Back then, that was the thing, right? There was a lot of activity around port scanning and that kind of noise. Yeah, and you can see, you know, uh, so I'm in central Maryland, which means there's a lot of security people floating around here by one way or another. So, you know, you can see the neighbor's port scanning periodically and things like that. Um, So, uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting. But what happened was um, I decided after playing with Snort for a month, I decided I would release it as an open source project. Because the other thing you got to remember back in 98 was that uh, open source was getting much more on the radar of uh, kind of enterprise computing and, and you know, the, the larger computing scene was really Early, early, into. early days, though. Mm-hmm. Like, why did you decide that? Did you already have ambitions to turn it into a product? Did you, all, none of this at all. This was just, it was just kind of tinkering and figuring things out on your own. 
Yeah, I thought it'd be fun. Um, so I, uh, I kicked a release of Snort out the door uh, in late December of uh, 98 to see if anybody would use it. And I figured maybe I'd get a few emails and it'd be a fun little uh, rainy day and weekends project. And uh, right. so I but kicked Martin, my release going a little too fast because there's a lot of the kids listening here who just only know about GitHub and CICD pipelines and pushing all this stuff. When you talk about releasing it as open source back then, it was what? Putting something up on a mailing list somewhere like talk. Help me help paint the picture. I'm trying to get to like the really, really early beginnings of this thing that would eventually become what it is today. Yeah. All right. So back then, the big tool site was called Packet Storm. So, um, right. Packet Storms were all the fresh exploits were, and it was also where all the new tools uh, were. So, when an exploit came out and it was actually released, um, Packetstorm was the place. There were a few other sites like Technotronic and stuff like that, but Packetstorm was like the the main the clearing default, house right, for yeah. new tools as well as new exploits. So I would farm the exploits to look for network based attacks that I could run into Snort to uh, figure out how to detect them. For example, and there were tools like Snort on there, and Nessus was on there, and um, y- you know some of the other uh, early uh, security tools, open source security tools, were on there as well. Um, so I contacted uh, Ken Williams, who was the guy who ran the site, and I said, hey, I, I got this new thing called Snort. I'd like to put up there. Could you put it on the front page for me? I, I'd like to see if anybody would be interested in using it. And he said, oh, sure, no problem. And so, you know, personal email. That was, what the, that was what the landscape looked like at the time. There was a lot of personal relationships and getting things pushed up, a lot of manual. Everything was manual. Like, how, do you, how are you getting feedback on these products? Is it like waiting for email or a month yeah, later? Get, yeah, yeah, yeah. We didn't have a, uh, did not even have a Snort mailing list at the time. So it was just individuals sending emails. So when you run Snort, the banner pops up, hey, you're running Snort. And it has, uh, at the time, it had my uh, email address in it. Right, right. Uh, so, you know, copyright Martin Resch, um, you know, Resch at whatever, Clark.net, I think it was back then. And um, yeah, so people looked at that and they, or they'd look at the documentation and they'd say, oh, this is the guy who wrote it. And they'd just send me a, a one on one email. So uh, was I it got instantly few- popular? Um, it was popular really like shockingly quickly. How did um, you know? And how and when did you know that you were onto something here? Um, the first real inkling that I got that things were um, percolating uh, was probably in the summer of 99. So the way Snort releases work, because I had a day job. So this is like six right, to eight right. months this after is a, I this is a hobbyist. This is a hobbyist thing that is taking on a life of its own. Yeah, exactly. So um, the summer of 99, uh, I was, uh, the way snort releases happened was, you know, I'd work my day job, then I'd come home and after dinner and, you know, um, whatnot, I'd, uh, I'd go to my computer room and I'd crank out releases of snort and I had my hand-built computers there and running all the different versions of, you know, BSD and Linux and, you know, I had like some secondhand sparks and uh, things like that running around, running Sun OS. Uh, so I can do cross compiling to make sure it was portable. And um, when I would do a release, I would kind of get to a point where I was like, "Okay, I'm at a point where this, you know, there's enough new features here and stuff like that, and I've I've tested it sufficiently and written the doc documentation and things like that. So I bundle it all up in a tarball and uh, throw it back out to to Packet Storm and a couple other sites. By this time, Snort had gotten notable enough that there were a few sites that were carrying it. So I'd send out se- several emails with the tarball in them that said, hey, latest release of Snort, um, feel free to put it up on your site. And then I'd go to bed, and this was usually 2 or 3 o'clock in the morning when this release got uh, pushed out the door. I'd go to bed, and I'd wake up in the morning, and I'd have a few emails, so, you know, like this feature. You started to this feel traction. You started to right. feel energy building around it, right? So in the late summer of... Um, of 99, I did a release of Snort that I didn't QA very well. So like I was tired and I was like just done and I was just like, here, take it. (laughs) And I kicked it out Uh the door and I woke up in the morning and I had like 50 emails and it was like, Snort's broken. It doesn't compile here. It doesn't work there. This feature's busted, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, holy cow, where did all these people come from? (laughs) Right. You had to uh, break it first to realize who were like using it and relying on it. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I stood up the Snort mailing list uh, shortly thereafter, like a couple of days later, to try to start coordinating the bug reports and, and QA and like, you know, started to do this iterative release. We had a public CVS server at this point, so people could check out the latest things that I had checked in and, and try them and compile them and stuff like that, because people were compiling their own at this time. You download it and you build it. Um, and, uh, you know, just to smooth out the the feedback loop. And... Um, 
all of a sudden, like within a couple of months, there were thousands of people on the mailing list. And I was like, whoa, well, this is, this is interesting. <laughs> was there um, ever an urge, was there ever an urge not to go the open source route or was it always in your mind that this was going to be the way it was? And then I want to talk a little bit about how you got into monetizing this and kind of building that model in the early days. Yeah. You know, for me, um, building the open source thing. So Early on in my Were you always one of those early open source advocates who were just like, everything wants to be free? This. No, uh, uh, no, 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 no. I wasn't like that. I was more of, um, I was really interested to understand it. So this, this, you'll see echoes of this in the SourceFire journey as well. So I was interested to understand how it worked and um, like how these things snowballed and progressed and things like that. So I was really interested in the journey as opposed to the, uh, the destination. One of the things, and, and this, this is going to sound funny. Um, one of the things that I kind of recognized early in my security career was that there were kind of two types of people in the security world. There were the guys whose names you knew and there was everybody else. And the guys whose names you knew had, you know, had different opportunities than everybody else and, and did different things than everybody else. And I thought maybe someday if I really play my cards right, I'll be one of those guys that everybody knows their name and that'll be fun. Um, but I didn't realize that Snort was going to be the trigger for it. And I wasn't even trying that. I thought Snort was just going to be this kind of interim step on my journey to doing something really relevant in security. But and, what the happened, guys who's, and the guys whose names we knew at that time were all focused on offensive security work, doing a lot of the sexy hacking things, right? Yeah, exactly. I mean, that, 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 those were the rock stars of cybersecurity back in those days. The defenders came along much later on, and people like you who made your name on defense came along much later, right? Yeah, I think so. Well, you know, it, uh, and the attack side guys, they became not notable because they were pointing out, hey, there's some real flaws in these systems that everybody's relying on, and like something needs to be done about it. Um, so while there was, you know, there was the true black hat, uh, hacker world, there were also the white hat hackers who were just trying to make security better, like the guys right, at right. loft and, and so on. Um, so yeah, it was, it, it was kind of a fascinating time for sure, because, you know, there were all these debates going on about, you know, d full disclosure or not, and you know, what, what disclosure worked and didn't work and how, do, how are we going to incorporate open source? And what about these open source licensing models? And, you know, are they viral where they infect other software that touches, you know, all this stuff was being uh, really hashed out in the late 90s and early 2000s. None of these answers were kind of written in stone back then. So, yeah, it was a very uh, Wild West kind of time. Um, but, yeah, I, I had no inclination that Snort was going to turn into the thing that really, you know, turned my career into something that, you know, that other than being, you know, just Joe Engineer. Uh, when and how did that switch get flipped? I mean, when so, did, at what stage did you realize... Um, uh, we can run a support business around this and create something really meaningful here. And what was that trigger for you? Um, well, there are a couple, two, two triggers. Uh, well, three triggers, I guess I would say. One, um, so I worked at a startup. Uh, I got recruited on the, on the power of Snort. I got recruited to go work at a startup and build the, uh, an intrusion detection engine for them. So uh, uh, this sounded really f uh, interesting and exciting after my government job where, you know, it would take months to get customer feedback. I thought startup would be fun. I'll go do that. So I went there and it kind of went for a, a little while, less than a year. And then, you know, it, it just, it wasn't, it didn't go well. Uh, the company was, uh, was really having a hard time. Um, so I left that and, um, I started thinking about what I wanted to do. So I sent out an email to the Snort mailing list that said, don't contact me at this email address anymore. I don't work there anymore. I'm, I'm back to being a free agent. I'm thinking about my next steps. And instantly I had like job offers, um, you know, from a bunch of places. I was like, oh, this is really cool. But while I had been at the startup, I kind of like, I really observed something, which is, you know, if you're at a startup and you... Uh, want to make a lot of money, unless that startup is like a Google or an Apple or something like that, um, then the people who really um, get the biggest benefit are the people who are early uh, to the to the game. And um, and I knew, still true uh, you know, today. <laughs> yeah, especially yep, still true. And I knew as I was 
working there that like my ideas, like I was coming up with original ideas, like real meaty, you know, new technology ideas. And, you know, I, I was just an engineer there. I wasn't a senior executive. I wasn't one of the founders. So it was just, uh, you know, here's an awesome idea. I just thought of a new way to, to attack this problem that nobody's ever thought of before. And they're like, oh, put a patent on it. And, you know, maybe it'll grow enough value in this company. So it'll be worth something to you down the road. And I was like, well, this seems kind of upside down. Um, so you're starting to see the value of your work and the value of your contributions in a real meaningful way beyond just as an individual contributor. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. And um, so I started to think real carefully about what I wanted my next move to be. And um, so I started talking to um, some of my kind of uh, uh, mentors and uh, people that I um, had, you know, these kind of conversations with. And um, they were, were really encouraging me to figure out how to you know, get people to pay money for, for snort, you know, this thing was right. free. And, right. um, so they were, they, 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 everyone had already known that snort had snort was, was, uh, an integral part of the defense. Uh, oh yeah. Uh -huh. Stack, yeah. right. The, the tech stack at that time for defenders, you had to use snort. So it's already on this, uh, this growth mode trajectory as an open source project and so on. So you're all, you guys are already starting to figure this out. Yeah, well, let me. I'll, I'll give you a stat, and this is one of the things that convinced me to go for it. So, um, as I was kind of mulling it over, uh, I got um, handed. So, Stephen Northcutt was one of my mentors, and uh, he was great. And he was like, you know, he uh, spent a lot of time brainstorming with me on how to like figure out how to get people to want to pay for Snort. And uh, one of the things he he sent me was. Uh, the results of a survey that the SANS Institute did. So Stephen Northcutt was a um, you know head of operations at SANS, and SANS obviously right. is this big organization. Uh, and I was an instructor there for a while too. And uh, he sent me uh, the survey results. And one of the questions on the survey was this big survey, multi-question stuff like that. One of the questions on the survey was which intrusion detection systems do you use? And it had all the commercial ones, and Snort was also on there. Check as many as apply. Snort was checked ninety-two percent of the time. And this is. Uh, you know, less than two years from you first had no inkling that this was the level of, of, uh, of no, none of at all. <laughs> and I was like, holy crap, okay, <laughs> exactly. It's really one of those holy crap moments where the data is there and it's showing you the obvious sign that this thing is, yeah, this thing has been massively adopted. And in fact, it is the most popular intrusion detection system on the planet right now. And, and already the snort rule language had become the standard for defining network-based attacks as well. And I was like, well, I mean, if I don't figure out how to make money on this, somebody else is going to. So, And this is still the early 2000s, right? We And then you guys were obviously aided by the Microsoft problems with security, which put it on the front page, the Gates yeah. memo, and all of that stuff would come later on, right? Yeah, this was, this was the fall of 2000. So this is... Uh, you, you dot know. com bust as well is happening right around that time as well exactly. if I remember correctly. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so those were the first kind of uh, two things. I came out of uh, the startup. I had a bunch of job offers. I was like, oh, I, I'm personally very remarkable. And then I found out Snort is as popular as it was. I was like, I, you know, at this point, I'm, you know, I have a reputation of being a relatively humble person. Uh, at this point, you know, this little voice in the back of my head says. You have world class ideas. Go, go, go! Do yeah. something with them. Um, so, uh, and at this point, I also had one of the other conversations that was going on was there was a security vendor that wanted to buy Snort from me, and they're like, "Willing, you know, cash on the barrel head, come work at the company. We'll give you stock, so on and so forth." And I finally got down to brass tacks and got a real offer on the table. And I just thought, well, if it's worth that much to you, it's probably worth a lot more. Um, I, I had a business model in mind and I decided to just go for it. So in January of 2001, I incorporated SourceFire uh, with the business model of building a value-added platform around the open source core, what, what's basically called the open core model now. Back then, you know, it didn't have a name because nobody had really done it before. That's um, what I was going to ask. When you say no one has really done it before, there is no model for you to mirror. There is no mimicking at that time. Nope. Was, no, it, was this just your own inkling that, you know what, there's a services model, there's, the, there's an entire thing that I can build around this? Like, how did you come up with this? Well, so I understood something kind of fundamentally about Snort that I think a lot of people, um, it wasn't obvious to other people, because I talked to a lot of people about it. I want to do this business model. I had a variety of feedback. Most of it was, that won't work. <laughs> and... Um, the business model, uh, what I understood was that Snort at the small scale solves problems, but Snort at the large scale causes problems. 
And the problems that sort at the large scale causes are different than the ones that it solves. So if you solve those large scale problems, manageability, scalability, performance, automation, and support, if you solve those problems, then people will pay you for that, right? Enterprises will pay you for that. They want the function, but they want that function to be manageable, scalable, automated, performant, and have a support organization around it. So I decided that would be the model that we would build at SourceFire. And um, so we went for it. I started the company in my house. Uh, so we were in my living room for the first year we were Did in business. Did you take in any seed funding at this stage or are you bootstrapping it? Uh, Steven Northcott gave me money out of his own pocket to get us wow. going. Um, you know, it was, uh, it was not a lot of money, but it, it was what he had available. And, um, you know, I gave him a, a little chunk of the company, uh, for that. And we operated on that money for 10 months. Uh, it was about a hundred thousand dollars. So we I, were, I don't want to derail the flow of this, but it's something you mentioned about, uh, just coming up with the confidence, uh, that you had, you know what? I have these brilliant ideas and the notion of confidence, especially among entrepreneurs and, uh, 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 uh not inferiority. What's the? There's a phrase for it when you you, you don't believe that you belong. Uh, you oh, it's yourself, imposter uh, syndrome. Uh, imposter syndrome. Yeah. Uh, you know, imposter syndrome is something that happens to a lot of young entrepreneurs and early stage op- entrepreneurs at this time. And I'm bringing this up because my audience is a lot of startup founders, security startup yeah. founders who re- like really want to think through these things. When you talked about that switch that said, you know what, I'm onto something here, and my ideas are actually quite brilliant because look at what's happening here. Was that imposter syndrome? Was that just your own modesty? Or like, how do you, how do you, is there a, is there a, a trick to getting over that hump? I, I don't know that I would say that there's necessarily a trick to getting over the hump. I think it's, um, to some degree, it's self-awareness. So I always have um, a healthy dose of doubt in the background. And it, it applies to everything I do, both, you know, people bringing me stuff as well as me coming up with my own stuff. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is to kind of trust my inner voice and trust my um, my thought processes, um, because you know I'm a fairly thoughtful person, and when I not so much methodical, you know, you're methodical not, about thinking yeah, methodical things through, and, and like yeah. I think things through for a while before like this business model I thought about for months before I tried to do it, um, and I don't know anything about creating business models, but you know. It, it, just made there's sense a, after your analytical thinking. It just made sense. There's always a part in the back of me that constantly reminds myself there are people who have built businesses, big, valuable businesses over the centuries um, that didn't have any idea what they were doing either, and they did fine. So go, you know, the important thing is to take a step and then take another step and evaluate, you know, how you're doing periodically and, and and have that, that confidence, you know, you, you got, you bring your, like plenty of people will tell you you've got bad ideas and you're terrible at this. Very few people will tell you you're amazing at this. Keep going. Um, you have to be that person that tells you keep going, uh, most of the time. Um, and you know, it's funny because, um, on the day to day, when you look at what you're doing, none of it ever really seems like it's very big and momentous. It's only when you look back that you can see the big and momentous things that you did. Right. Um, so the important thing is just to take the next step, take the next step, take the next step. The world will let you know if you're completely off base. Like that's very obvious. You know, the company runs out of money and has to shut down. Okay, right, not right, not right. great ideas. Um, but you know, if you're if you're doing well, it, you'll see it, um, and it, it'll it'll show up in results, uh, and you'll be able to look back and say these were these were obviously good things that we did. Does imposter syndrome seep into your life now? I mean, does that is that something that pops up every now and then, especially with the fast pace of technology moving? I'm a technology journalist for 20 years. And, and mm. many times today, I'm looking through some of these cloud security concepts and so on. And it feels like, I, I don't know if there's a thing about aging out of this industry or if this, mm. there's a little bit of imposter syndrome trying to figure out, do I really know and understand all of this? Is yeah, that something I, I that crosses kind of- your mind? I, I do feel like, you know, sometimes I feel like, am I missing something? Did, like, did I miss some big inflection point that, right. that, that like, because I don't understand, I'm going to, like, I'm completely off base here. But, you know, I have good ways and I have a big uh, network of people where I can kind of Bump head check myself and periodically trust, yeah. and say, hey, you know, like in the business I'm in now, one of the things that got me to jump into it was the fact that, you know, almost everybody that we compete with is on architectures that are, you know, 20 years old. They're all on appliances and they're all doing deep packet inspection. And neither one of these things work very well in the world that we are in and moving into at an accelerating rate. And, 
you know, I look at it and I'm like, I thought this stuff was like toast 10 years ago when Sourcefire got acquired. Um, and here we are and none of it's changed. So did I miss something? Right, <laughs> like, right. So that pops up occasionally. And a lot of the time you have to do a smell check with your own internal network and your own kind of peers, right? Yeah, exactly. Uh, let, let's go back a little bit to, so now, now you guys are off and running, you're creating this company. Can you talk a little bit about what the competitive landscape looked like at the time? And, and mm -hmm. you know, how long did it take before source fire was a, a going concern where you're starting to see the IPO down the road? Like, wh what does that look like? So, um, let's see. So at the, when I got the company started, uh, the big gorillas were like ISS and Cisco. Right, uh, right, so, right. That yeah, was Rob. Internet security systems. Uh, Rob was creating this black ice stuff over there, right? Yep. Yeah, Black Ice and uh, Nate Lawson with uh, uh, Real Secure before oh, that right, and stuff right, like that. Right, so, right, right, right. And they also had their vulnerability management business and all that stuff, right? So they were a, they were a big company. And then you had Cisco, who was a gorilla. Um, right. And there were a few others like NFR and uh, Intrusion.com and things like that. So, um, you know, some golden oldies. So, uh, you know, I, I got the company going and we had a, you know, we had a friends and family network right out of the gate because of Snort, right? So right. Snort... Right laid the the playing field um for the company very quickly so even when i was selling literally selling only over the phone out of my house doing shipping and receiving in my front hallway and builds in my kitchen like literally building appliances out in my kitchen we had real customers uh our first four customers were uh pricewaterhouse coopers intel saic and um international paper and that um, and know, that and that, that it came out of the snort community that had came out of the snort community like we didn't have any marketing. Our entire marketing budget was my .sig file in the bottom of my emails on the on the Snort mailing list. It's crazy That's it. to think today, right? Yeah, right. And we had no funding. Either. Like at this point, we we were still operating on the hundred thousand dollars that Stephen Northcutt gave me out of his own pocket. So uh, and credit cards. So um, you know, we're doing these builds in the house and shipping, and receiving out of the front hallway, and I'm taking phone calls on my back deck. Uh, because I had a six month old daughter and I didn't want people to think we weren't a real company if right. she started crying. <laughs> so, um, you real know, and, and then we sell drama, them. right? Like really, yeah, real then we life. sell these, these big deals. We sell these six figure deals, four, six figure deals in a row off, you know, like off my back porch, basically. And up to that point, nobody would give us the time of the day in the, in the venture capital world, especially cause you know, it was the dot com crash was in progress. Right, right. But were you trying to raise? Were you trying to raise? And were you trying to, were you like already uh, investigating the options? I was investigating it because it became very obvious to me that if we didn't have enough money to compete with it, companies yeah. like ISS and Cisco, we we're just going to get bulldozed. You know, you can be the best kept secret, but that's not a great thing to do in the enterprise right, security right. world. Um, so, uh, yeah, you know, we were doing these crazy deals out of my house, and then all of a sudden the venture capitalists started saying, oh, geez, you can sell stuff that's free? Tell us more. Right. Um, and, uh, when you know, did you take the first we, round of funding? Um, how, old was, first, how old was it? Uh, well, Sourcefire was one year old. We were, it was in February of uh, 2002. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah, so that was the um, the first tranche of the Series A, and then I went and raised the second tranche with um, – um, you know, a, a West Coast lead. Um, so we raised about uh, a little over seven and a half million dollars in the Series A. Um, and, uh, you know, once we had that, started hiring and, and bringing in talent and uh, moved out of my house into an office, which was nice. And, um, you know, started turning into real company. And, and when I knew that we were kind of on the path to an IPO, I mean, there were some tumultuous moments, right? So the IDS to IPS transition happened in 2003. Right. Can you talk, talk a little bit about that as well? Because there was a lot of doubts about the viability of Snort and the viability of Sourcefire around that time. I'm, I'm pretty sure you're familiar with those conversations about this shifting oh, yeah. dynamic. Yep. So funny story. Uh, th the first kind of real, uh, real world deployed prototype of intrusion prevention actually happened on the Snort engine. It was a set of patches that someone submitted uh, to me. And, uh, I was like, eh, I don't know. Uh, you know, cause the signatures weren't really very high fidelity in a lot of cases. So with the false positive rate, what are you going to block on, right, right. uh, you know, that kind of thing. So I was like, oh, I don't know, you know, visionary, right. <laughs> so, <laughs> speaking of imposter syndrome. Um, so, uh, y you know, the whole idea was kind of prototyped on the snort engine. I, I poo pooed it. And then, uh, you know, a couple of years later, it shows up as tipping point and, uh, introvert. And I was like, what the, what the heck? Um, so, uh, yeah, we were kind of, uh, caught our pants down to some degree and it was a one, two punch, right? So you had these two companies that came out with hardware accelerated intrusion prevention systems, 
Uh, and you also had Gartner coming in saying, well, intrusion setting detection. The, setting the category and putting an acronym on it, right? Yep. Exactly. Intrusion detection is dead meat. Intrusion prevention is the way of the future. And, you know, and here's two IPS vendors and everybody else is kind of like, good luck. <laughs> and, um, yeah, and I was like, holy cow, what are you talking about? Intrusion detection's not dead. Come on, you're killing me here. <laughs> you know, I'm feed my kids. Right, right, <laughs> with right. This, with this business. And, um, yeah, so it was like this really tumultuous thing. And I was like, well, you know, well, let's go <laughs> let's go look at what we did with Snort to get it to be an IPS back then. Um, so, you know, we started like coming up with a plan to come up with an IPS. Uh, and at the same time, uh, I had an idea for another technology that turned out to be SourceFire's big differentiator. So we had to do, execute two things at the same time. One was build, uh, you know, turn Snort into an IPS engine. Uh, and, and, and was that so. allowed, did that require a, a complete re-engineering or you already had the plumbing in place to be able to get that done easily? It's not, yeah, it's not really re-engineering because it's the same, it's the same uh, uh, detection logic, same stream or something. Like most of it is exactly the same. It's kind of where you plug into the uh, network adapters and what you do when you see something you don't like, right? Let so, me ask a stupid question right here, especially as it relates to the Gartner setting, the category. Did that force you to pivot or did that help you figure out that you had to pivot? Because uh, uh, there's a lot of entrepreneurs today creating technology and building products for a category that Gartner has already defined rather than just kind of building for what you know the buyer wants. And there's that, you know, there's that balance of trying to figure out how am I, how do I follow whatever the, the, the where do I follow the industry is growing? Do you feel at that time that Gartner forced you into it or helped you get there? That's a great question. I think, um, I push back against Gartner. Like we had, we had a a not very nice uh, public fight over the the future of intrusion detection back then, and um, they weren't entirely know, I, wrong either. It it wasn't, but it, like everybody kind of, it could have been done better. Like everybody could have done a better job. <laughs> I'll, I'll just put it that way. You feel, um, you feel like a, that as an industry, we lost a lot of resources or wasted a lot of resources in not getting it right from the early days. Um, I don't think so because there's kind of, you know, there's the, there's the art of what's possible with the technology that you've got, right? So you have to get networking technology to a certain point before you can do something like intrusion prevention because doing deep packet inspection at speed with high load, you know, enterprise loads and stuff like that, there's a lot of uh, compute memory um, that's required to do that. And, you know, we were on x86 architectures, not on custom ASICs and stuff like that. So we were kind of beholden to the Intel architecture and, and we made our our bet on on that being the way to go, which we turned out to be right eventually, but it took a while to to get ahead of the uh, ASIC guys um, and the limitations of ASICs. So um, I don't feel like we wasted a whole bunch of time and effort kind of getting from point A to point B. Um, I, I do think there, there's a mix of Gartner kind of defining the market and kind of forcing our hand to some degree because um, customers started saying, well, what are you doing about intrusion prevention? Because that's what they're reading from them. Uh, on the one hand, but on the other hand, there's also customers who are saying, we're going with this because, uh, you know, the tipping point box doesn't see everything that you guys see, but what it does do is it blocks a hundred things that are definitely bad. Right, um, right. And you don't block them. You require us to go like deal with it. And it's like, okay, Makes I get sense. that. So I got cu customer push and I also got, you know, I'm hearing it that, you know, you got to do something about this. So we built uh, IPS into Snort and we also we built the secondary technology called real time network awareness or RNA and we, uh, to, to drive context into Snort so that Snort got a lot smarter about its environments and when we finally came out with our IPS product we were actually highly differentiated and we had you know a lot of great things in our in our corner which which turned us into the company that we turned into and still pre IPO right there. still pre IPO at yeah. that time the IPO yeah, we didn't IPO when? till 2007 seven right. Yeah, so it was a year, a year after March of 2007, a year after the checkpoint deal uh, got shut down. We will get <laughs> to that in a second, but I want to talk about the 2000s, the early 2000s era, mm -hmm. and the, the era of the Windows War. And we talked about, you know, the, the Gates computing memo and all of that stuff around 2000. How much did that help, like pour gasoline on this fire of of, of a cybersecurity industry? And uh, were you were there ever? Um, a tendency to want to focus and re-engineer for what's happening, uh, uh, mm. uh, pivot the company in any way? Uh, typically, no. So uh, one of the things that I always try to... Um...